Hello, everyone, and welcome to Life After the Military, a show completely focused on reversing the trend of veteran suicide, homelessness, and problematic transitions by helping veterans transition from military to civilian life and strengthening the mental fitness of our active duty military members, veterans, and their families. Our show is powered by Pivotal Moments Media, an organization on a mission to strengthen mental fitness worldwide for all. Make sure to go check them out at pivotalmomentsmedia.com to learn more. My name is Lee Elias, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host, Howie Cohen. We are privileged to have Brad Thomas with us today. Brad served over 20 years in the Army's Special Operations Forces community as a member of the 3rd Ranger Battalion and 1st Special Forces Operations Attachment Delta. Brad retired from the military in 2010 after earning five bronze medals, one with a V device for valor. For those not familiar with this distinguished accomplishment, this high level award is and recognition may only be earned when in combat. And again, Brad earned five of them. Brad currently enjoys life as the founding member of the popular all veteran rock band Silence and Light, which was formed in 2017 in New York City. And in Brad's own words, Silence and Light takes their music royalties and gives them to special operations, veterans, and first responder charitable organizations. They don't take any money for what they do. They produced and released their first album, Volume One, in 2019. I've heard it. It is fantastic. Make sure you go check that out. Brad, welcome to Life After the Military. What's going on, guys? How are you? And thanks for having me. Hey, it's great to have you, Brad. I appreciate your being here, man. It's a privilege to have you, as, as he said, Brad, again, a two-time Pivotal Moments Media podcast interviewee. He was so good on the first show we did, we had to do another one. Again, I've been looking forward to this one on life after the military. And jump right into it, Brad, again, you served as a member of the Army Special Operations Forces for over 20 years. The first question we always ask, share with our audience how you prepared and executed your transition out of the military into the private sector, which again, you have a cool story there. Uh, what went well? What did not go well? What would you do different? And what would you do if you had to do it all over again? What advice do you have for those transitioning now? I've done multiple deployments. I've done peacetime Delta Force and saw what that was like, everything that there was to do. And so I was ready at 12 years. I was ready for a new challenge. So at that point, hey, do I stay in and get this great pension <laughs> and health care for life? Do I take a job in the civilian sector? I got offered a job as like head of training for Secret Service special operations guys and stuff like that. Do I do that? And ultimately I just, I felt like I owed it to stay where I was, owed it to those guys and, and just keep on it and maybe not feel the way I wanted to feel personally, but continue to contribute. I, I never fully identified as just being a soldier. And I feel like that's one of the things that probably helped me. I feel like advice that I could give would be don't fully identify as just that thing, because in many cases it gets taken away and you referenced that, but most of the guys that I've seen that have had, and I don't mean it to sound this way, but guys that got injured and had to transition out or got medically released or retired, guys that had served in the Rangers, got to the unit and on their first deployment got banged up and got sent out of the army. And they, they never really got to fulfill their uh, dream and, right. and the thing that they sacrificed to be. So I feel super fortunate and I got to do it on my terms. And that's second part is I didn't fully identify as, hey, this is all that I am. And I knew that I was going to lose the identity. Like right. I'm no longer a Delta Force operator. I no longer have that kind of swagger and that feeling. Of, I can't tell you, man, how special that felt. Like, especially for some of the things that some of the missions that didn't happen that I knew about, that we were literally waiting for the thing to go off so that we could go and do and being out at a restaurant that night being like, hey, I know we're going to get called in a few hours, probably and go do something that the world won't even hear about for a week, you know, or whatever it might be. But anyway, I, I knew that stuff was coming to an end. And so I feel fortunate right. that I got to do it on my own terms. You know, Brad, I'll tell you before Howie jumps into his next question, we've done a lot of these episodes and, and it's an interesting point you're making because we find with problematic transition, loss of community is usually one of the major factors that causes depression, can lead to suicide. But you brought up the other one is identity. You lose your identity. So I think that's actually, it. I'll say interesting advice because there's a lot of people that do identify through their military service and when it snaps off and that's the end of it. They have a hard time transitioning that identity to something else or finding a new identity. So 
I actually think that's uh, really good advice if people can do it of, listen, you're not just this. And again, it's how he's going to go into this. You have a whole other side to your life that you tapped into after this. That's so, pretty amazing. So to inter- interrupt, you, you yeah. reminded me of something. And it's one of the things that I feel like nobody's really talking about. And I've tried to in the last six months or a year or so delve into it. But there's this whole aspect of shame that comes from guys that get guys, gals that get separated from their unit for whatever reason. And if I think back to my time in the Rangers, so this came up in a conversation and it was, at what point are you a fraternal member of an organization? Like I met the Rangers for a year and I get a DUI and I get sent down the road. Like, where am I allowed to still claim that I was a Ranger? When does that unit fully recognize you? Is it a heroic act that makes you stand out? But what I see is that there are a ton, I I see mainly only guys, but there are a ton of folks that have been separated from their unit for whatever reason. And they feel like the shame and embarrassment, and they think that we all remember what their deal is. And I've done a really, I've tried to do a really good job of reaching out to some of the people that I know that are in that situation and say, dude, nobody cares. Right. Nobody remembers. Nobody is, thinks less of you because you got a DUI or you did some dumbass thing on it, whatever. Nobody cares because we've all got our own stuff going on. And Brad, listen, I, I actually really appreciate your answer about your transition. And the neat thing for me is that you decided at the 12 year mark that I need to move on to something else. And one of the pieces of advice I got from one of my mentors was very similar to yours is you go on your own terms, you pick your time, right? And then you did that. The thing I really love about what you said though, is that you had an identity that was not completely dependent on your time in uniform. And, and that is exactly the issue I see a lot of veterans, you know, troubled with is that is their soul identity. It doesn't matter what they did, but they completely identify their entire being with their military service. And I think it's, and I I love the fact that you very early on in your military career recognized there was more to Brad Thomas than just Brad Thomas, the operator. And I will tell you, for those of you who are transitioning right now, getting ready to transition or know someone who's transitioning, if you can for yourself, learn from that lesson and understand that you are a father, you are a mother, you are a brother, you are a sister, you are an aunt, you're an uncle, you're a friend, you're a member of a religious uh, community, whatever. There is more to you than just you in a uniform. And when you understand that and you, and you credit yourself for that, this whole transition process will become a lot less stressful and a lot more successful. Know that there is more to you than just your time and your being in a uniform. And if you can accept that and embrace that, I think that is probably the most significant step you can take to maybe preparing yourself for a very, a, a much lower stress and a much higher successful transition. We should mention that goes beyond just military transition. That's really yeah, a life it lesson, does. right? Yeah, this it is at a college, at a job. It yeah. yeah, it's yeah. everybody. That's one of those things where I, I refused, and it probably didn't make me the ideal soldier, but I refused to give all of myself to the military. And I don't know if that makes sense. I remember being in basic training and we would finish the day's events and be back in the barracks. And finally, after getting the barracks turned upside down and having to remake the beds and all that garbage and everything else that you deal with there, me and a couple of guys that also had ranger contracts, and we would just sit around and shoot the breeze. And it might be from two to three in the morning. We would get an hour and a half of sleep and then you're back <laughs> doing it all over again. Oh, those were the I days, man. used not to have my little time, my claim, this is part of my day that you can't fuck with. It's not yours. It's mine. And you can't. And anyway, 
Hey, good for you, man. I, I, I really credit you for that because, because that's not common amongst most people in uniform to be very, very candid and honest with you. But listen, I think there's a great lead in actually to, to our next question, because obviously you have a flair for the creative. It was interesting when I was doing research, but what I love the fact that you actually patented a piece of body armor, the ballistic uh, resistance groin protector, and the army fielded it. Now, this was back in 2011. The army fielded it in 2016. I, I, I assume it was through, what was the name of that? It was the, the Rapid Field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, for those of you who are not familiar with that, when needs came up in combat units and there was a there was something they needed in a combat environment that, do, that we didn't have, if they identified that need, we had a process in the Army and maybe in the other services too, I'm not sure, but I know for sure in the Army, where we had a unit that would take would would collect all that input from combat troops and uh, and then look at how they can bring something to the combat environment and and bypass the whole acquisition process because we had troops in need in combat and we needed to bring something much faster that could make them more effective save lives whatever and that's part of what Brad did. He, he created another piece of body armor that helped protect the troops in combat. So what I'd love for you to do, just talk us through how that whole process for you came about. I, I think that's a fascinating story to share. Sure. The last several years that I was in Delta Force, I worked in the R&D, they call it a combat development directorate. And, gotcha. and it's really responsible for researching and developing new, it could be anything from uh, ballistic eyewear to weapon systems to munitions to night vision all of that stuff and my commodity was stuff that was near and dear to me which was everything that a guy would wear so ballistic protection uniforms footwear eyewear all of that stuff camouflage was a big part of that too so it was a part of fueling a new camouflage to to the delta force and that transition to the whole military yeah it was an effort that me and several others were working on and some really talented pe people think of a patent as, oh, I have an idea about something and it's, it, it really has to do with the functionality of something, how something performs or how something operates, things that make it different from, it, it doesn't stand out as like obvious. So anyway, the, the thing that I cooked up was the way that it could be folded and basically took that from a, an idea that I had about origami and how the paper is folded and everything else. And I had Googled on the internet, like how to make a duck or something out of a dollar bill because I owed somebody a dollar for something. And I made this like little origami thing and put it there. So anyway, that's where the idea came from. And I've been a part of a ton of stuff, pretty much everything that you see current US special operations wearing, I had a part in that in some way, shape or another, pretty significantly. So that's really cool. So it, what, what, what I find even interest, more interesting then is you were doing that in your latter years at, your, at Delta, which again brings up another thing that Lee talked about earlier. The two key things that we find that a lot of veterans who, who have suicidal ideations and have problematic transitions, Lee mentioned that the loss of community, which Brad did not suffer from because again, he saw himself as more than just a, a guy in a uniform, but, but he had a sense of purpose in that, how can I help protect myself and my, my, my teammates in uniform and how can I continue to help them after he got out? So that replaced that sense of purpose you had when in uniform, because you're still doing things that were important to you that were bringing value to at, at, in this level into the military. And, and I would offer to those, again, listening, as you start planning and preparing for your transition, find other communities to join, whether it's a sports community, a religious community, it could be a work community, it could be a band, maybe you're, you have a musical, artistic bent, whatever, but find another or several communities to replace the military community that you're about to step out of. But equally as important is replace the sense of purpose you had in, in the military with something that you're going to do outside the military, whatever it may be. What has become my sense of purpose and our sense of purpose here is how can we lower the high rate of veteran suicide, homelessness, and, and problematic transitions? I wake up every morning, just I cannot wait to dive into it and yeah. get after it and see how, what can we do 
to help save lives. So whatever it is that you you need, look for it, find it and commit to it. And I, I love the fact that probably eased your, the stress of your transition right there is doing that, yeah. that kind of work. It wasn't intentional. So when I went and took that job, it was more about giving my family a break and kind of doing some family maintenance. And it was never the intent of, hey, go take this job so that it can help you transition. And it wasn't until about two years in, and it was my time to rotate out. And I'm like, I'm less than a year out from uh, starting the ACAP process of, of transition, transition out of the army. So it would be dumb for me to go back and try and fill another duty position and then back and forth. And at that point too, I was working for myself in that no one was telling me what time to be in in the morning. If I needed to do something, I could do it. It wasn't reporting and having to go do et cetera, et cetera. And I very much like that. So I looked at it and I thought, I don't necessarily want to go back and do that. Not from the operational side of the house and not because I didn't enjoy the mission or the training involved with all of that. It was more, hey, I'm ready to move on to Brad's agenda, Brad's schedule and what's good for him. And so I finished that out. And then when I got out, one of the things that I recognized was to your point, it's about purpose. And I found that through that and through the music and other things that I do, the giving back to the community is probably one of the greatest things that you can do to feel that sense of purpose. So I tried to be an example with the band to say, here's something that I did. I'm not asking people for money. I'm not you know, asking for a handout or anything else. If you buy a song, you stream our music, you're unwittingly contributing to charitable organizations that that help veterans and first responders. And that's period. So I, I like giving back that way, but I also still with the things that I do in creating and developing new stuff for special operations and other folks. And that very much feel the same way. Yeah, there's a component of that that's financial and I make money off of it and I make really good money off of it, but that's not my passion. That's not my passion. It funds my passion. <laughs> which is a good place to be. So let's talk about that. In doing research, I, I, I understand that you've loved music ever since you were a young boy, a, a young man. Let, talk to our audience about your love for music growing up and what motivated you to form uh, Silence and Light in 2017. Yeah, it was just exposure to things. And I was a person that was not only did I love music, but I loved, you know, performing, playing creating my own stuff. And so my earliest memories are making up songs in the back of the car. My dad would be yelling at the asshole in the Buick. And I would start singing a song about the guy in the Buick and things like that, or singing about the firehouse or whatever it might be. And, and that's really where it started. And my parents, to their credit, and I don't think it was intentional, but they exposed me to live music at a very young age. And as soon as I saw it, that kind of solidified Hey, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to be. I want to entertain. I want to create and do that. And I tried and it didn't work out. <laughs> and at some point I can tell the story about how I ended up where I ended up and joining the military, but ultimately it, it ran its course and it came down to making a decision and figuring out what to do next and join the army just on a whim. Tell us about forming the, the band. What kind of motivated you to do that and take us through the process of of bringing the band to fruition. One of the things that working in the in the CBD portion at the unit, in the section of the unit, was it gave me a lot more free time and I wasn't deploying, although I did deploy once while I was in that job. It gave me the opportunity to re-explore the music scene. And so started a, started a band, but really the intent was just to get myself out there and put myself out there so that I could work my way up to whatever the next level band was and ended up being in probably the larger of the bands that were in uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina at the time. And we opened up for a lot of the national acts that came through. So really? oh. you know, we ended up getting to perform for pretty decent sized crowds and things like that. And so I knew at that point, you know, I had played all along during my career, I played music and had guitars and things like that and just continued to accumulate stuff and gear and things and anyway so that's where it came from and then really it came down to once i separated and retired my wife and i would go out 
to have drinks and dinner every Friday night, like a date night thing. And I, I would tell her things. I, I just feel like I'm a ship out on the ocean, as corny as it sounds, and I'm just looking for the light. Tell me what to do. Tell me how I can help. I don't want to start a foundation and ask people for money and do that kind of thing. There's a ton of good stuff already there. How can I help? And one week, she'd have me running for office. And the next week, it would be something completely different. And anyway, one day, she said, it's a shame that you're not doing anything with all this stuff. And I've got like room full of gear and guitars and all kinds of stuff. And I was driving the next day to, to meet one of my bandmates, now Jason Everman, who was in both Nirvana and Soundgarden before he joined and became a ranger in 1994. Oh, wow. I was driving in to meet him to go see a concert in Manhattan, and all of a sudden it just clicked. Like, hey, you're not using this stuff, and you're going to meet a friend who was in the music business too, and you guys probably could do something pretty cool. And that's where the idea came. So. He and I were having a few cocktails before the concert. And I said, hey, man, I, I just literally got this idea of putting something together. I don't know what it's going to be, if it's you and I doing something or if it's going to turn into something bigger or what it might be. But would you be down for this? And he said, absolutely. So within a couple of days, I started a social media page and just tried as best I could through pictures and a few words. Hey, here's what I'm trying to do. And over that summer, got contacted by the guy that ended up turning out to be our bass player, who was a former MARSOC officer. Oh, and, very cool. You know, hey, I just got out of the Marine Corps. I don't know what you guys are doing, but I want to be a part of it. And it just grew from there. To include our producer, who is a former Marine veteran, and he got out of the Marine Corps after four years, but ended up just killing it in the music business. Probably one of the biggest uh, producers in LA today. Wow. Josh Goodwin. So anyway, he reached out and said, I don't know what you guys got going on, but I'd be happy to help and produce your album and let me know how I can help. And I took him up on it and I held him to it. And next thing I know, he was producing our first album. So that, that's how it came to be. And the idea was create music and then take royalties from whatever you sell or stream and give those to charitable organizations. Initially, the idea was that every person in the band would have his own charitable organization that he could contribute to. And then you can realize very quickly, okay, splitting royalties five ways and then having to do this. And we need to stand up a S corp so that we can deal with finances coming in and out and not being personal and blah, 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 blah. It ended up being literally creating a business. And as the Things like this, doing podcasts and media and writing articles and that kind of thing. I just ended up being the person that was doing all of it. So it ended up being me talking about the, the thing that I was contributing to and the organization that I was contributing to. So we decided to let's streamline it. Let's just make it two organizations that we contribute all of this to and, and we'll go from there. And I think the next album will probably elect to do a different charitable organization. And it's more about bringing awareness to what they're doing than it is I mean, how much we contribute. Listen, just for the sake of our listeners, because I've listened to your music, it's definitely the style I grew up with. Why don't you, this is never a fair question to ask a musician, but why don't you tell people your influences to give them an idea of, of what, what they could expect when they stream your album? It's interesting because as a guitar player, I would tell you one thing. And as a song writer, I would tell you another. Right. And so it's hard for me. I never, before this band, never wrote my own music. I was always in bands that if they were original, I was just showing up and playing. And I don't think that I had the depth to really be able to write the stuff that I liked. And so the second part of that is like the, the people that influenced me that I would say that I connect with the most are like the bands that talk about the dark stuff and kind of come from a place of you can hear the trauma in, in their songs and things like that. It's not necessarily happy music right it's not oh bummer downer music either i would put nirvana <laughs> in that category i would put alice in chains in that category i would put jane's addiction in that category and i would put so really as a song writer i feel like that era of music from 88 to say 95 ish right really had an effect on me that i didn't even know that it had on me 
And going back down to Fort Benning after being gone from the place after 15 years or so, and all of a sudden reconnecting with that music, like the first time I ever heard Nirvana was low crawling down a hallway as a private in, in the Ranger Battalion. Like I still remember it to this day. And that was the soundtrack of my life and right. my buddies' lives at that time. I returned to the hangar in Mogadishu during the battle to grab more stuff, to offload casualties and to head back out. And Alice in Chains was playing on a box, a boom box that somebody had in the hangar. And so it had a significant wow. effect on me, probably differently than as a guitar player, I would say, I love Eddie Van Halen. He right. just you know, epitomizes just about everything that you could put a, a guitar player into. At least as a listener, felt some of what you're talking about. It was heavy metal, hard, hard rock and grunge influences are right there. And look, there was a power uh, just against, from my experience, there was a power to that music that's tough to find today. It's funny because some of it's coming back in the new Batman movie, Nirvana's all over that. You know what I mean? And they're going for that kind of feel. But yeah, if, look, if, if, I think you said it right. If you grew up in the mid to late 80s, early 90s, uh, there's a lot of the same feelings when I listened to your music that I felt listening to that music, although completely different contexts and situations. I felt that. And it, from, from the first song, I was like, oh, wow, this is for me. Yeah, <laughs> Remember, uh, cool. so I love what you do, man. I love what you do. So look, before we get into our last question, it is a tradition here that on our show, this show, I give all of our guests, if you were to write a book, I suggest a book title for you. All right. And I have two for you. Okay. Not silence and light is too obvious. So I'm not going to use that <laughs> one. That's that when you guys do your, your big band picture book in the future, use that, but I've got two. One, one is serious. One is funny. The serious one is I'm more than just a uniform. I think that if there's anything we take away from this episode today, that's unique to this episode. It's that it was okay for you to identify beyond just the military. And I'll, I'll tell you what, man, I think sometimes a lot of people in the service who are the most selfless people I've ever met could accidentally consider that selfish. And I think the key is, and, and I would love your thoughts on this actually, is that both of those things actually can coexist. You, you can actually identify and have other loves and other aspirations while still being selfless in your service. I don't think those two things collide um, unless you're an asshole. There's a difference there, right? But like you have dreams, you had aspirations, that you kept alive. I actually love that you said, oh, this is my time. I'm going to keep my time. I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think that's extremely healthy, to be honest with you, even in that situation. And look, man, I have zero combat experience. I would not begin to even act like I understand what it would take to, to go into a zone or do what you guys have to do. I do imagine that there's training mentally that you have to have, but I don't think you have to completely give up who you are to move forward. Yeah, I'd actually like to jump in here and, and, and just pull a couple things out. Go Number for one, it. for those of you who don't really know about the special ops community, and especially the, one, the unit that Brad served in, you go through a pretty rigorous psychological assessment to get in there. So they're looking, and I'll tell you, one unit I served in, not only did you go through psychological assessments, and like Brad's unit, you go through a very st st really tough physical and mental assessment as well. But ours culminated, and, and I don't know if yours did as well, Brad, but it culminated in the each candidate sitting in front of a board of the right. leadership of the unit, asking questions and basically doing a panel interview. And it was designed to in, in, increase the mental stress that the individual had to go through. You mentioned the music genre that, that, that you operate in is a little bit dark. Y you sound to me from the conversations we've had, and we've had a few of them, you're really balanced. You're very much in control of yourself, in control of your thoughts. But I, I wonder, is it even a form of therapy in the way you write your music and bringing some of that out? Is that another way to help you manage you know, yourself? Where, where does that come from? The type and the depth of the songs that, that you're writing, where does that come from? A couple of things. One, I feel like there are only two things that I do where I'm just in the flow state where I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing and I'm just enjoying the, the feeling that I'm getting from it. Cooking or grilling is one of them. And the other is playing guitar and, and creating music of some type. There's a moment when as a group of individuals in our rehearsal studio, when we hit something and it works it is orgasmic. The, the feeling of man, that thing has some balls. It's got some power. It's got some emotion. And when you can feel that, 
it's a really powerful thing. When I started this thing, it wasn't to be the guy that's out there or to play like I'm a rock star or any of that. It was to be an example to other people to say, hey, I've lived the dark stuff. I've lived through all of it. I'll compare my resume in combat with anybody out there. And if I can do this and figure out a way to be healthy, positive, and creative to offload some of the bad stuff and some of the dark stuff, if I can do it, anybody can do it. That's really why I started this. And it comes back to that. So some of that comes out through the music. It's not, hey, I want this song to sound like Alice in Chains. I want this song to sound like this, or I want it to, it's not that at all, but it's to be an example and to say, if you can figure out a way to be healthy, positive, and creative and give back to the community, you're going to, you're going to feel a whole lot better about your situation, no matter what. What a phenomenal freaking answer, Brad. I, I, I absolutely love it, man. Brad, I'll tell you, our last question was about mental fitness and how you practice that, but I think you might've just answered that. My quick follow-up is just, and you alluded to this just at the end there, just how important it is for others transitioning to find ways to practice mental fitness. This is often something that everyone goes, yeah, I know about that. I know about that, but nothing really happens. And we always equate it to go into the gym. If you want to be in shape, you know what you need to do. You need to work out. We need to do more on a mental front to, to work our minds out. You've shared this whole episode, how you've done that. What would your advice be to, to those transitioning about the importance of that and, and how to find what, what their version of what you do is? It takes time. And I think just in talking about how the band formed and how it came to be, you're talking about a period of probably four or five years of wow. just me trying yeah. to figure out like, right. I was busy with other stuff. I'm doing other things. I'm contributing financially to units and helping out and things like that. And so it took some time to figure that out. And I think being a part of the community and staying tied in with the community, there are a lot of guys that I hear that are like, I'm getting out, I'm moving to the ranch in Idaho and I'm getting the hell away from everybody. Hey, do you, but being isolated like that sure isn't a good thing. And uh, so staying tied into the community and, and to go back to the other thing that I was talking about, in terms of shame and things that people might feel from whatever experience happened, however many years ago it happened. I know that there are Mogadishu things like the 30th anniversary is coming up and there are still people that feel shame from things that happened then. This award ceremony, the, the most recent awards upgrade ceremony that happened this past October. Imagine being a person that everybody knows was there Hey, did you get upgraded? No, I didn't. I didn't get upgraded. Sorry, I feel like a piece of shit for not getting upgraded. 60 guys got upgraded, but I didn't. 29 years later, still feeling some sort of grief from that. And I'm starting another project at, at some point here next year that's going to talk a lot about that stuff and go into that pretty significantly mainly as a way to prepare this entire generation, two generations of people that have served during the GWAT to say, you're still going to be dealing with stuff 29, 30 years right. later, if not 60 years later, if not whatever. So get yourself, you're not going to find the answer in a bottle of anything. You're not going to find the answer in drugs or anything else. You got to mentally get yourself right. If it takes talking to somebody, do what you got to do. If it takes expressing yourself through art, writing, drawing, painting, creating of any sort, woodworking, make flags. It could be anything. Find out what it is, help be positive, creative, and, and contribute back to the, the community. This has been, it's been just a joy to have you here today. And I'm hoping that this is just the beginning of, of a strong personal and professional relationship as well. well. So we throw this statistic around of 17, somewhere between 17 to 22 veterans, you know, committing suicide daily. But the, I just found out about a week or two ago that the number has actually climbed to 40. And the, and you talk about shame, you know, this concept of survivor's guilt, right? And folks who have served and lost their buddies in, in the, quote unquote, foxhole next to them, but at least justified it in their mind in some way that we're doing some, we're fighting for some greater good. Now we're questioning, what the fuck did we do this for? Why yeah. did my buddy lose his life for this? And, uh, and now we see folks with those feelings taking their lives because they, they have a hard time dealing with 
with that. So whatever you're about to do, whatever that project is, we would love to, to, to if we can help in any way and be a part of that, I would love to have conversation with you about it. I just, from the bottom of my heart, it just does me so good to see someone who has, from a very early time in their career, has managed his mental fitness in the way you have. And what an incredible example for others to follow and to learn from and to replicate. And I hope that um, so many people listen to this episode and learn from it and more importantly, apply those lessons learned because I think it's phenomenal what you've shared with us today. I appreciate you having me on. And if it weren't for people like you both, guys like me wouldn't have an outlet and a mechanism to get the word out more than through social media and other things. So I appreciate what you all are doing very much the same. Listen, just in the, uh, the interest of brightening this up before we end it, your other book title, <laughs> the funny one was, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The other one is that uh, don't ask me about my day job, how I became a rock star. That should get some people's <laughs> attention. See that one on a, see that one on a I bookshelf. Think I think there's a misnomer that if you play music and put out an album, you're like immediately rich and, and rock star status. And not at all. <laughs> people don't realize that like bands don't live together. They generally don't even live in the same state. Uh, a lot of them don't travel together. They fly in for shows. They fly out, you know, the next day kind of thing. Part of it too is we're contributing royalties. So we're giving away money that we were earning. But if we were to split that money five ways, it's a completely different, like that's not sustainable. So if people want to help contribute to the band, buy merchandise, buy a shirt, buy whatever, that'll help. If you want to contribute to organizations, it's best to buy the music. But if you stream it, listen to it on whatever platform, that helps too. It's everywhere you would normally get music. So oh, all I, streaming I, platforms. Yeah, if you fine. just Google silence and light, you'll Boom. find everything. You will. everything. At the end of the day, it's the love and the passion for what you're doing that drives you through. And, and it's like most things in life. If you're not doing it for that, you're probably not going to succeed anyway. Like, again, that, that's a whole nother. We need to start a whole nother music podcast. Talk about that. <laughs> we're not going to do that right now. Listen, Brad, you, you were awesome as expected as always. And can't thank you enough for being here. Oh, well, again, appreciate you guys having me on. So thanks. And, uh, you know, keep after it. You've been listening to Life After the Military, which again is powered by Pivotal Moments Media. I know we received some value from this podcast. We hope that you did too. Uh, so if you did, please subscribe to it, rate us on Apple Podcasts, share it with others to help get the word out. And please, if you haven't done already during this episode, check out Silence and Light. You can Google them. They're, they're everywhere. If, if you're a late 80s, early 90s, hard rock, heavy metal, grunge fan, you're going to love this stuff. And again, check us out at pivotalmomentsmedia.com to learn more. We have other channels that focus on overcoming adversity in sports, how to inspire women, building mental fitness in the workplace, how artists of all types overcome adversity and strengthen their mental fitness. Uh, and of course, we have our mental fitness education center, which has uh, and houses more inspirational, educational and entertaining content. So for Brad Thomas and Howie Cohen, I'm Lee Elias. Thanks so much for joining us. Keep an eye out for more episodes soon, wherever podcasts can be heard. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time on Life After the Military. Thank you.